Well, good morning, everyone. Before we get started uh, in our sermon this morning, I just wanted to uh, share how excited I am about these opportunities that we've had as a church, uh, starting last week with the Salvation Army and how we can bring in gift cards to support them and the work that they're doing with the food bank and with some of the most marginalized and uh, people in need in our society, in our city here. And so uh, I'm grateful for that. And uh, this week, uh, I'm really excited to make you aware of what's going on with St. Vincent de Paul. And next Sunday, from 9 to noon, we're going to be doing another uh, drive-through food drop-off uh, for St. Vincent de Paul. They need lots of things like canned goods, like, like canned tuna, for example, is great. Uh, one of the things that just really hit my heart hard when I was talking with St. Vincent de Paul is how they need these meals in a can, and the reason they need them is for kids who are at home and whose parents maybe aren't involved enough or engaged enough or for whatever reason aren't there to make them a meal. And it, so it needs to be something easy that the kids can make for themselves, like El Fagetti. And that one really uh, struck a chord with me and hit my heart. And so um, that, that's one of the ones I'm going to be focusing on, myself and my family. And so I just really encourage you to, uh, to come and to give uh, in that way. And then uh, next Sunday, we're going we're gonna to talk about the third uh, local organization that we're going to support. Um, and so look forward to that. And one of the things that I am so excited as, as we plan things like this to give back to our community, it's just such an encouragement to me as a pastor here that when we launch these initiatives, that I have full confidence that you are going to be, that you're going to step up and be generous. Like you have just done that time and time and time again. And I'm just so proud to be part of a church that when there's an opportunity to give to people in need, when there's an opportunity to support a ministry, whatever that might look like, that you step up and you help and you are generous and there's an outpouring of generosity. And I, I'm just so uh, proud and excited to be part of that. And so thank you for that. And uh, let's keep going. Let's keep loving on our community and supporting those who are in need in this challenging season. Um, the other thing I want to say is thank you to Leanne for sharing that testimony of how um, she has prepared, had this posture of allowing God to interrupt her life in various ways and, and being okay with different directions that he took her on that maybe weren't her plan for her life. Um, and this morning, as we jump into the text in this third week of Advent, we're going we're gonna to hear the story of, of the shepherds and the incredible supernatural interruption um, God brought into their lives and how, how the sign he gave them and the way that he, he shared with them that Jesus was going to be born, this Savior, this Messiah, um, how he shared that was just an incredible word for them specifically that was good news for them, good news um, for the Jewish people to which they were a part of, and good news for all of us, including us. And so um, as, we, as we look at this uh, interruption, this significant interruption into the lives of the shepherds, uh, I hope that you'll be encouraged and blessed and find hope in it. So uh, without further ado then, let's, let's jump in uh, to the passage uh, this morning. And to set the scene, Mary and Joseph uh, are going down to Bethlehem. They're going down to Bethlehem where they have to go and they have to check in because he's from, uh, he's from the line of David and they had to go for the census in Bethlehem. And on the way down, it becomes apparent that she's going to have the child. And so they have to, they have to find a place for them uh, to stay and to have this child. And so we'll pick it up uh, today in Luke chapter 2. And uh, if we can, we'll start uh, in verse, in verse 6. And, and it's saying, when it says while they were there, it's talking specifically about Bethlehem. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, Luke, there's, there's something about Luke that's important to notice. Luke was, he was very, very careful and particular 
about the details that he put in scripture. He was a really good historian, and he, and, and he puts certain details in there, and they're really meaningful, especially to the, to the reader of, the, of that time um, who would have been immersed in that culture. And sometimes uh, in our culture, we kind of gloss over some of those details um, because we're reading it from a different cultural lens. And so I wanted to share with you, as we look at some of the details, why those details would have been significant and profound. And so the first thing I want us to recognize as we read that so far is that when she gave birth to the firstborn, a son, what did she do? She wrapped him in cloths. And, and uh, some versions will actually say she wrapped him in swaddling cloths. And then the other thing I want you to pay attention that we're going to come back to is that she placed him in a manger. These two details are very significant when it comes to the sign that God is about to give the shepherds about who Jesus is and what he means for the people of Israel and for everyone. And and so keep that in mind, that he was wrapped in cloths and placed in a manger. So let's continue. So now the shepherds come on the scene, and it says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. Okay, so this is important. Shepherds There were shepherds, and where were they? They were living in the fields nearby. Nearby where? Well, we were just talking about Bethlehem. Keeping watch over their flocks at night. Okay, so this is significant. Um, In those those days, normally they did not want shepherds keeping the herds close to towns or cities. Why? Because, let's face it, I grew up on a farm. Animals stink, and nobody wants their manure around the town or the city. Uh, that's not fun. You know, the town that I went to high school in, if the wind shifted and were blowing uh, in the opposite way that they normally would blow, we would smell all the feedlots in the area, and it, and it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a great, great smell. And so they, they, didn't want, uh, pe- they didn't want the flocks. But Jerusalem, or sorry, not Jerusalem, Bethlehem was an exception. Why? Because Bethlehem is where they kept the flocks that were specifically to be without blemish and perfect lambs for the purpose of the Passover sacrifice. All right, so these shepherds then, also it's important to note that these shepherds were not just your regular, uh, everyday, run-of-the-mill shepherds. These shepherds were specifically what they were called Levitical shepherds. Now, Levitical Le- Levites were people who served in some kind of way uh, to help administer and take care of and prepare things to be used in the temple. Um, And so these shepherds were were specifically preparing and taking care of the lambs that would be sacrificed at the temple during Passover. And, and, And they had to be very careful at how they did that. And, and, one of the ways when it says keeping watch over them, often they would do so from a tower on the hill, that, uh, the Tower of Medal, that looked down over the valley below where the flocks would be. And so this is, this is the scene. These are who the shepherds are, and this is the scene. So uh, with that in mind, let's, let's keep going here. All right, so It says, then an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Okay, so again, I want us to to note some things. He says, the angel says that he's going to bring, that he's bringing them good news But it's not just good news for them, it's actually good news for all the people. So what is this good news, and why is it good news for all the people? And we're going to see as the passage goes on that indeed it was good news for all the the people in that area and even beyond, Um, and we'll see that as the passage unfolds. So then the angel tells them about this sign, and he says, this will be a sign to you. So this sign is specifically for the shepherds, and they would have great understanding of this. So, so pay attention to what the sign is. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So remember earlier in the passage, it says 
that Mary wrapped Jesus in cloths and lied him in a manger. Now, why is this significant? Why does this matter? Why would this, sa- why would this sign be profound to those shepherds? Why would that be good news for them? Well, you see, part of what the shepherds did is, is when it was time for a, a ewe to give birth to a new baby lamb in those flocks, they would take them to caves. And, and when we think of the manger, you know, when we think of the manger and we think of it as, as like this wooden barn, it actually was more than likely a cave. And so they would take these lambs, they would take these ewes and they would take them to these caves and the babies would be born, the baby lambs would be born in these caves and to make sure that nothing happened to them in that, in that early season of their life when they're most vulnerable, the shepherds after the baby was born would clean them up and immediately then would wrap them in cloth and lie them in a manger. So we see that just the way that these baby lambs that were to be the, the Passover sacrifice were wrapped in swaddling cloths and lied in a manger, Jesus, Jesus, they do the same with. And so this sign would have immediately, they would have recognized this as shepherds and they would have been like, this is exactly what we do with the Passover lamb. What does this then saying about this child? Well, In order to understand that, and we're going to get there, we're going to have to go to a little bit of a history lesson about why Passover was significant and what its meaning was. But before we get there, let's continue in the passage. It says says then that they go to Bethlehem to see this child. They go to this, this, this cave near Bethlehem to see this child. And it says, when they had seen him, and they saw that the sign was true, that he was wrapped in clothes, and he was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, it says they spread the word concerning what they had been told about the child. So as soon as they see this, they're like, wow, this is good news. This child is to be this ultimate Passover sacrifice. This is good news. And so they go and they start telling everybody about it. And it says, all who heard it were amazed. They were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them, that this child was somehow going to be this Passover sacrifice, that there was this connection. This was significant. So then why, why why was Jesus to be this ultimate Passover sacrifice? Why was that significant? Why did that matter? Well, in order to understand that, we have to go back and have a look at how how the feast of the Passover and the celebration of Passover came to be. So if we go back, it starts off with, with the Israelite people, and the, the Hebrew people, and they are enslaved in Egypt. And, and Moses goes to Pharaoh and he asks him, uh, as he's told by God, to let the, the Hebrew people go. And Pharaoh's like, no, I'm not going to do it. There's no way I'm doing it. And so God sends these these different plagues on Egypt um, to change the mind of Pharaoh to let his people go. But, but Pharaoh just keeps getting more and more strong about his stance on this, and he's not going to let the people go, and he makes their working conditions harsher and harsher and harsher. And finally, God says to Moses, tell all the Hebrew people to go inside, to, to slaughter a lamb, and to have a meal together, and to paint, before you go to bed tonight, paint over your door frame with the blood of the lamb. And he gives them very specific instructions about how to paint. So he tells them to paint the doorpost, both sides, paint both sides, and to paint the top. Well, if you look at that, he doesn't say paint the bottom, he doesn't say just throw paint at the door wherever you want. He's very specific. Why? Because When you make two lines like this on the doorpost and a line over top, it actually makes the Hebrew letter chet or chai, which means life. They were literally painting over their doorpost life so that when the angel of death came, it said life over the door and he would pass over. 
And so these, these lambs that were sacrificed, their blood that went over the doorpost actually was what spared the Hebrew people from having their firstborn um, die just like the Egyptians. And, and so after this, uh, Pharaoh wakes up and he says, get out of here, like he's, get out of here. And so they leave and, and Pharaoh changes his mind, he starts chasing them and, and they miraculously are able to cross the Red Sea and, and the Egyptians are swept up in it and the Israelite people are now free. They have their freedom and they're told every year to celebrate this in Passover where they would, every year they would have a lamb that would be sacrificed, they would eat it together and have a certain meal uh, together to celebrate Passover. And, and the priest would sacrifice these lambs as, as like an offering for sin. Well, what is sin? For those of us that don't understand it, sin is really just, it's missing the mark. It's falling short of all who God has asked us and created us to be. It's falling short of, of the two great commandments, to love God and to love others. And so they would make these sacrifices as an atonement for sin. And part of it was also that they would eat unleavened bread. And leaven was then to be a symbol of sin. And so they were, during that time, not to eat bread with any kind of yeast or leaven in it so that they could be reminded to have no sin in their life. In fact, they would even play a game with the kids where they would have to go around and search the house to try to find any leaven. And they would literally sweep then all the leaven out of the house as a symbol of saying, we don't want any sin in this house. We don't want to, we, we want to live pure lives for God. So when we think about Passover then, and we think of the significance of Jesus saying, sh showing the angel telling them that Jesus through the sign is going to be the ultimate Passover lamb, what he's saying is Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice to pay and to set us free from sin. To set us free from where we don't fall short. To set us free from the different things in our life that enslave us, that entangle us, whether they be addictions, whether they be that we're given to trust in our money more than God, whatever it might be, the things in life that are dragging us down, Jesus, Jesus wants to set us free from that. Jesus, the freedom that Jesus is giving is not a freedom because we're enslaved necessarily to a certain people group the way that the Israelites were, but it's a freedom from the power of sin over our lives a freedom to be enslaved by that. See, Jesus, he wants to set you free. I truly believe that. Jesus wants to set you free. He wants to give you freedom from whatever is dragging you down in life, whatever is holding you back, whatever is stopping you from becoming uh, and embracing all that you could be in Jesus, all that God created you to be, anywhere that you're currently falling short, Jesus wants to give a freedom in, a freedom to live life with meaning and purpose the way God intended. Jesus wants to set you free. But here's the other thing about the Israelite people. So they get out of slavery and, and they're free now, but what do they start doing? You know, life is still has its challenges, and as they face some of these challenges, what do they start saying? They start saying to themselves, well, you know, let's go back to Egypt. Really? Egypt, that place that you were enslaved and treated harshly and had really harsh working conditions? Yeah, let's go there, because at least there, at least there we had, you know, we had meat to eat sometimes. And here's the thing, just like the Israelites were enticed to go back to Egypt and be enslaved all over again, we will be enticed sometimes to go back to those things that are holding us back. We'll be, we'll be tempted to go back if we've been given freedom from, say, something like a porn addiction. We'll be, we'll be tempted to go back to that. If we've been given freedom from from not putting our trust in, in our wealth and our money, but putting our trust in Jesus. We've been given freedom from that. We'll be tempted to go back and put our trust in that again. And so Jesus wants to set you free. And, and there's, there's a moment of, 
of being set free, but then there's a posture then, from then, of living free and not choosing to go back to Egypt. Walking in freedom is both a moment when you're set free and then a posture that you need to walk in. But Jesus, I believe, this Christmas season wants to set you free. It's the very purpose for which he came. Secondly, from this story, I believe that God wants to speak to you. I mean, think about the very specific sign that he gave to those shepherds. Those shepherds were the most equipped people to fully recognize and understand that sign of Jesus being wrapped in cloths. Many people would have overlooked that. They wouldn't have grasped it right away. But those shepherds, that was the very sign that would connect with them right away. And I believe that God wants to speak to you in ways that will connect directly to your heart and your soul and your mind the way that he did to the shepherds. He wants to speak his word of truth into your life. He wants to share with you his son Jesus and the love that he has for you. He wants to speak that over your life. And and I believe he wants to do it in ways that will connect with you in very meaningful ways. And will be very meaningful to you. And it might, it's not, it's probably not going to look like the shepherds with angels and the whole bit. But, but he's, I really believe that God regularly speaks in our life. And, and he wants to speak to you uh, this Christmas season and going forward. The third thing I want to say about this story is that then God wants you to share the good news. The shepherds, immediately after seeing the sign and seeing that what the angel had said to them was true, immediately went and were sharing the news with anyone in the area who would listen. And the people were amazed by the news. Here's the thing. The message that Jesus came and and lived a life full of miraculous things and then died and rose again to set you free from sin's grasp on your life, to, to, to awaken you to all that life can be. That good news, and it's very good news, God doesn't want you to keep that good news to yourself. Be like the shepherds and share that good news. God wants you to share the good news. It's not news that's just meant to be hoarded for yourself, for you to enjoy, for you to experience the freedom when Jesus sets us free, it's supposed to compel us to want to share it with others so they too might be set free. And so with that in mind, I want to I give you three questions that I want you to think through, that I want you to ponder, that I want you to meditate on, that I want you to even pray on. Three questions. The first question I want to ask you is this. What do you need God to set you free from? What is it in your life that maybe has a hold of you, that's holding you back, that you're like, if I could just have freedom from this, life would be so much better. I I would be, I would have more joy and I would just experience life in a much more meaningful way. What is it that you need to be set free from. Whether you've never heard this message of Jesus before or you've been walking with Jesus for a while, what is it in your life that you need God to set you free from? And when you think of what that thing is, I want you to ask God, I want you to surrender that and say, God, I want to give this to you. I want freedom from you, from this. God, I, I admit that in this area, I'm currently falling short. I'm not measuring up to loving you and to loving others. And and by the way, one of the best ways to show your love for God is by obeying him, by walking in obedience to what he's called us, on how he's called us to live. What do you need God to set you free from? Confess that. Share it with God. Say, God, I don't want, God, I trust that Jesus wants to set me free from this. I want forgiveness from this. I want to walk in freedom. I give it to you, and I want to follow you with my life, God. 
whether you're doing that for the very first time today or you're being reminded to do it again, what is it that you want God to set you free and then from? And then give it to Him. And then remember, though, remember, though, to walk every day, walk in that freedom. Every day, choose to walk with Jesus away from that thing that once enslaved you towards the life, the, the life that He has for you. Because you'll be tempted to take it back up again. And often, the, the, the road to freedom is a process. And we keep walking more and more in the freedom that, uh, that Jesus offers us as we walk with Him. And we start leaving behind more and more the things that previously dragged us down, that held us back from all that God desired for us in our life. The second question I want to ask you is, how might God want to speak to you? Because remember, I said before, I believe God wants to speak to all of us. And in fact, I believe God is speaking to all of us regularly. It's just often we're not in a posture of listening, and so we miss the very things God is speaking into our lives. And God speaks in so many different ways. Some people, He speaks to a lot in dreams that they have and visions. Um, sometimes it's pictures that come to their mind. Sometimes it's just like small little thoughts and whispers in our mind about what God might be saying to us. And, and we can weigh this in what we know about God and what we understand about Scripture. We can go to the Bible and look and say, hey, does this line up? We can ask, if, if, you've, if you're fairly new in this, you can ask somebody, hey, that you know has been walking with God for a while, you can ask them, hey, does this, does this line up with who God is? Does this sound like something God would say there's ways that we can discern whether it's actually God that's speaking to us. But I want us to have a posture of listening. I want you this Christmas season to be, have a posture where you are expecting God to speak into your life. You're listening. You're, you're being aware. You're looking to see where is it that God is speaking to me. God, I, I'm ready. I want to listen to you. I want to hear you speak into my life. Have that posture and he, he will. It won't always be how you, how you maybe thought it was going to be. It won't always necessarily always be in the moments that you hoped it would be. But God is speaking into your life and wants to continue to do that. How might God want to speak into your life? And how might you have a posture that allows you to be aware of how he's speaking into your life and receive what he has for you, that he wants to speak to you this Christmas season and moving forward? And then the third question is this. How might you share the good news about Jesus with others? As I said before, this good news that, that sets us free, it's not meant to be kept for us. It's meant to be shared with others. And so what I want you to do is I want you to think about who are the one, two, three people that you can think of, and, and you can probably think of more, but at least think of one or two or three people in your life that you know who need to hear the good news about Jesus. And then I want you to take a step. I want you to start intentionally, regularly praying for those people. And here's how I want you to pray. I first of all want you to pray that God would be at work in their hearts, stirring in them, making them open to receiving the good news about Jesus. And then I want you to pray that they would have opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus. And then here's where it gets really personal and maybe makes us a little bit nervous. I want you to pray that God would specifically give you opportunity where you can share the good news with Jesus about them. And then I want you to be listening and watching for when those opportunities are and when they come to make the most of those opportunities by sharing the good news of Jesus in, way, in how it's appropriate to that situation. It's important that we don't keep this good news to ourselves, but if we are to share the good news, we have to be intentional about it. The shepherds could have gone, seen what they saw, and said, isn't that amazing? Yeah, that was great and never told a soul. It was, it was up to them. But they, they just 
were so full of joy that they wanted to spread the good news with all. And so I want to encourage you, who is it this Christmas season that you need to begin to pray for, that you begin, need to begin to in, invest in, in intentional ways? Who is it that needs to hear this good news? And how might God want to use you to be the one to share it? Because Jesus, Jesus came to set us free from sin. Set us free and give us life. Not life eternal, to be with him for all of time, but also to give us new life where we can walk in freedom in this life. And that is good news indeed. Good news that is more than worth sharing. Let me pray for us this morning. Oh, Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for what you did, that you came and that you were, that you chose to walk in obedience to your Father and, and die and raise again and be rose again, God, that you chose to be that ultimate sacrifice so that we could walk in a right relationship with God. And I pray today, God, for all those who maybe who have never heard this message of hope and freedom before, that they would choose to say yes to it today, Jesus. And I pray for those of us who have been walking who have made with you, who have maybe heard this message before, I pray that it would become renewed in our hearts and minds, just what you did for us, God, and that we would walk in a posture of walking in freedom with you, and that we would, we would, re we would repent of any area of our life that we're not currently walking in freedom, and that we would give that to you. Help us, God. Give us Give us ears to listen to you this Christmas season that we would hear how you want to speak into our lives. And God, would you give us boldness and courage and just joy in sharing the good news, both in this Christmas season and moving forward, Jesus. Would you just fill us with boldness and courage to share the good news and love for our friends, our family, our co-workers who currently haven't experienced the freedom of walking in with you and so i just pray you would you would give us love for them i pray you would give us courage and boldness to share this wonderful news i pray this now in the mighty name of jesus amen